Okay. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time, the time in this very snowy, uh, cold, and dreadful London day to be here with me to um, celebrate the launch of my book. Um, before I get started telling you a little bit about my book, I do want to uh, thank the School of Social Sciences and Professions and the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Center for making today's event possible. Um, and of course, I will be thanking the guest speakers today and Lakis for uh, the um, excellent sharing of today's uh, book launch. So I wanted to begin today's uh, book launch by, can you hear me well? Yep. By talking a little bit about my positionality as a researcher and basically where I'm coming from with this research. So I'm a social psychologist, but my research does draw from both sociology and sociolinguistics. Um, hence why two of my guest speakers today are a, a sociologist and a sociolinguist. My research does focus on LGBTQ plus language and identity. Uh, this is a topic that I've been interested in since I was doing my master's uh, back in New York City, where I explore the ways in which bisexual, no, sorry, not bisexual, bilingual Japanese uh, gay men use language to express their sexualities. So upon finishing my master's in 2016, I, I began to um, explore PhD programs. And in doing that, I was trying to identify you know, what's next in this line of research in terms of language, gender, and sexuality. And in 2015, 2016, there was a great deal of discourse around non-binary identities in the media, particularly around uh, Facebook, having changed their settings to allow people to use they them pronouns. So that got me thinking, you know, this is a, an interesting area of research. What is out there within the psychological research looking at, at this community, uh, particularly in terms of language? And I found that there was nothing <laughs> or not that much, particularly in the field of psychology. So that led me to explore non-binary identities and language for my PhD. I wrote a um, a research proposal for my PhD, which looks nothing like the final product, <laughs> but which is really common, by the way. Um, and basically, this PhD is what you're seeing in this book. So this book is based on my PhD studies, uh, which I finished in 2020, right before the pandemic. So I do want to talk a little bit also about my stance as a researcher. Uh, I'm a queer and feminist researcher within social psychology, and I do take a trans affirming and trans inclusive stance to my research. And what that entails in practice is seeking to represent the plurality of lived experiences. So what does it mean for LGBTQ plus people to live out their lives in the social settings? Um, in doing this, I have found that I've developed a more nuanced understanding of gender as a becoming in my research, but also in my in my personal life. So I am part of the LGBT community, so I'm a cis man, I'm a gay man, sometimes I use queer man, and sometimes I simply use queer. And I added the question mark following that because in, in the spirit of becoming, which is sort of what the book is about, uh, who knows <laughs> what I'll identify as in the future. 
Additionally, in, in terms of this positionality, I'm also a first generation immigrant from Colombia uh, whose parents didn't go to university, so I come from a working class background. I want to talk about today's event uh, because I think it's important to set out some guidelines, if you will, for what this event is and isn't. So today's event is not a debate on the existence of trans and non-binary people. This is not a debate on whether they exist, they do. Um, instead, this is a celebration of a book uh, that examines the lived experiences of non-binary people in terms of language use. I'm not claiming to have all of the answers, uh, but I'm here to uh, provide some evidence that the language surrounding gender is complex and constantly evolving. That gender is a process, a possibility, a becoming, one that is socially reconfigured and renegotiated in an ongoing basis. And that gender is a multidimensional concept that involves language, embodiment, sense of self, psychological states, history, and other affects. Now, you may not be familiar with some of this language or all of it, which is okay, uh, but in the spirit of the first point of this not being a debate, on the existence of non-binary and trans people, I expect a respectful and affirming stance towards gender diversity in this event. So I want to begin for the third time <laughs> by uh, mentioning a really useful quote for the way in which I've analyzed my data. So this is a look. Uh, they are an artist, poet, an LGBTQ plus activist, and they said, being non-binary is not just about my gender, but also about rejecting dichotomies and oppositional thinking, affirming my own complexity and simultaneity. It isn't just about being defined by my absence, but also by my abundance. It's about embracing my fluidity, my becoming, my journey without a fixed destination. So every time I give a talk uh, on my research, I do have to provide a sort of non-binary 101 definition of what I mean by gender non-binary or gender uh, non-binary gender identities. So non-binary gender identities are often found within the trans umbrella, although not all non-binary people identify as trans. Um, and that definition in some ways is uh, given that their gender identity and expression does not align with the gender they were assigned at birth. So in other words, non-binary people do not solely identify as men or women, but perhaps as neither, or both, or and, in addition to. And in this, uh, uh, within this umbrella of non-binary, there's also expansive vocabulary. So some people may identify as non-binary in addition to other terminologies, such as genderqueer, agender, bigender, gender fluid, or gender fuck which um, I'm yet to meet anyone who identifies as gender fuck. So in terms of social and legal representation, in the last couple of years, uh, there's been quite a dramatic shift in the way that non-binary gender identities are understood, some positive changes, some negative ones. So there is, I, I would say, more social and media representation uh, about non-binary people uh, since I started my PhD back in 2016. Uh, 
there are more public figures coming out as non-binary. So for instance, some of you might be aware of Sam Smith, who a couple of years ago came out as non-binary and uses they them pronouns. So there is an increased awareness of uh, non-binary people, but there is also a great deal of pushback uh, in the media and a great deal of anti-trans rhetoric, uh, sort of this so-called gender critical perspectives, which uh, have dominated a lot of the discourses on trans and non-binary people in the media. In terms of uh, legal status, the Equality Act of 2010 um, recently, so in 2020, finally started uh, including non-binary people within the categories of uh, gender reassignment. So non-binary people are outright uh, included within the Equality Act, but there's no legal recognition in terms of gender recognition certificates. So if someone wants to transition legally, there's no a system in place for them to transition as non-binary. Um, and because of this, they are unable to have their gender recognized uh, in their passports and other IDs. Uh, something that in other countries, I believe in Germany, for instance, Denmark, if I'm not mistaken, is actually possible. So for someone to actually self-identify as non-binary. So as I mentioned, the, the focus of my research has been on language. And so it's important for me to clarify why language is important. So um, I take a gender affirming, trans affirming stance to research and uh, several non-binary people, as I mentioned before, may use labels such as non-binary, agender, and so on to identify and to label their identities. Um, they may also use pronouns such as they, them, z, e, and other neo-pronouns to uh, I ask other people to refer to them. Um, some may use titles such as MX or MUX uh, instead of Mr. or Mrs. and so on. And overall gender neutrality such as chairperson instead of chairman, uh, actor, humankind instead of human or mankind. Uh, I already forgot what it was. <laughs> Uh, but just to be clear, not all non-binary people use these linguistic markers, but I think it would be fair to say that most would be sort of well-versed in, in the usage of, uh, of this type of language. Um, using this language does provide a level of social recognition as well as legal legitimization of uh, their genders. And language, in fact, does have the potential to both enable and inhibit the articulation of gender. Um, in the psychological literature as well, um, recently has been found that linguistic invalidations, in other words, not using this type of language for someone who, uh, who wishes to be referred in these ways, does have negative psychological effects and repercussions. So the use of this type of language is really critical. Um, in doing this, my research uh, aimed to capture the linguistic, the social, and the psychological experiences of non-binary people. And this is due to the lack of research uh, in terms of the linguistic, so how they use the language, as well as the material, uh, so meaning how they embody their genders in terms of expression and perhaps body modifications of some, some sort of non-binary gender identities. This is despite the fact that in the field of linguistics, uh, language has been found to be a quite central element of of this identity. And 
in the field of sociology, often self embodiment is ignored. So my research then aimed to um, examine what I called and theorized as the gender and linguistic becomings of non-binary people, which I define in terms of how they learned, they adopt, they describe, and they negotiate non-binary language, if there is such a thing. And of course, how they navigate the social interactions uh, using language. Additionally, I aim to examine this idea of embodiment and materialities within, uh, within the, the data. Um, all in all, I wanted to understand how they negotiate identities, authenticity, and embodied experiences, both online and offline. So this is when things might get a bit more like a lecture, although I already feel like I'm giving a lecture. Um, I did use something called assemblage theory, which uh, if you're familiar with the field of psychology uh, in the way that it understands gender, uh, there are two sort of main uh, ways in which gender is understood within the field. Uh, of course, you know, there's complexity within this, but there's mostly the kind of positivist epistemologies and the social constructionist epistemology. So the positivist perspective on gender understands it as a biological reality, something that is innate and you're born with, um, and is mostly used as in studies as perhaps two independent variables. So gender is used as comparisons between men and women. Um, any kind of gender diversity is often understood in the terms of diagnosis, um, in the terms of gender dysphoria, and it posits that binaries are stable. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, social constructionist theories within psychology, drawing from sociology, would claim that gender is socially constructed, that is contextual, so it, it depends on the language that is used, and it aims to understand how gender identity categories sort of come to be through social interactions and through the histories. And in doing that, binaries are a product of social interaction. So assemblage theory, which is what I use for this analysis, aims to dismantle this binary of positivism versus social constructivism, of nature versus nurture, and so on, and understanding gender as a becoming, not as a state of being. So not as an essential part of the self, but as something that is in continuous process. And in doing this, uh, aims to examine the complexities of gender and the multiple a multitude of relations or if I borrow language, which comes from a lot of French philosophy of the loose and Guattari, this idea of affects. So how one affect affects another and vice versa. So I use this materialist methods. I'm not going to get too much into the philosophical parts of it. I've already said enough. Uh, but I aim to investigate the various linguistic contexts. Uh, so I examined 22 interviews with non-binary people living in the UK, and I also asked them to provide a short writing sample, um, some of which may feature their, the way that they use language for themselves. And I also created a 2.9 million word corpus based on a uh, forum, online forum, where non-binary people discussed and talked about their identities, uh, which I, I have kept anonymous where that form comes from. In doing this, I analyzed the relational patterns within the data and uh, which provided me with a kind of robust and coherent analysis looking at this three sources of data, uh, which I analyzed uh, both quantitatively in terms of the corpus and qualitatively uh, to understand 
you know, what was happening within the data. So in terms of the participants that I interviewed, uh, all of them employed the label non-binary for themselves. Uh, most of them used it in addition to something else. So uh, agender, genderqueer, trans, trans feminine, trans guy, uh, woman, femboy, non-existent. Um, and the majority of them use they, them pronouns. One of them used he pronouns. Um, and another one used he, his pronouns. In terms of the non-binary corpus, uh, which I call the NBC, so if you're a basketball fan, you'll be mad at me. Um, uh, I analyzed it, as I mentioned earlier, in a quantitative method using discourse, a corpus-based uh, linguistic computational analysis. Wow, that's a mouthful. Um, in terms of frequencies, keyness, collocations, concordance lights, and so on. Um, to then create a smaller sub corpus of that. If you have questions about the methodology, uh, you can purchase it. <laughs> um, and in doing that, I created a visual network of what I call non-binary language, although it's it's not a stable thing. It's, it's basically a snapshot of that particular corpus. So I just want to show you what it looks like. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but I analyzed some significant words within it. Uh, you can see these words, uh, which are with mouse, uh, are quite intense within it. So that means that the word woman was quite significant within the, the corpus. Uh, gender, of course, people, identity, sex, percent, restroom, uh, and so on which I then, in that subcorpus, I analyze in a qualitative way. So I'm going to talk about two findings within the book uh, as briefly as I can, and uh, talk about this idea of linguistic becomings, which is kind of the theoretical uh, approach and contribution of, of this body of work, uh, which again entails the adoption the reassessment and negotiation of language within social interaction. And uh, another key finding on language related distress. <clears throat> so Elliot, who uh, uses they, them, and identified as a genderqueer woman, mentioned that learning about non-binary identities was so important. I think it pushed me towards finding new ways of and expressing my gender identity. It gave me new words to understand my sense of self, and it gave me a drive to take steps towards seeing what feels good and what doesn't feel good, and what other language I want to use about myself and what uh, others, what other ways I want to express my gender. So in this broad concept of linguistic becomings, I analyzed it at the individual level. So I found that many individuals uh, understood language as shifting, and they recognized that it shifted alongside their embodied desires, uh, which may also change over time. And they were guided by the available linguistic resources that had emerged over time. So many uh, participants talked about the idea of finding the label non-binary at a later age in life and kind of having a eureka moment of, oh, wow, that makes a lot of sense for the way that I've, that I've felt for these many years about my gender. At the interactional level, so sort of talking to uh, other people within their social context. You know, that negotiation was very much uh, context dependent and a case by case negotiation where disclosure uh, with family members, with friends, with employers, and so on um, really was a constant negotiation of, of coming out and safety in many cases. Um, and that many linguistic parameters were formed, but they were rarely a static. So they were always kind of shifting depending on the context. 
And at the societal level, uh, in terms of language, you know, many found the need to become socially and linguistically linguistically intelligible, namely to uh, to make sure other people understood them and understood their genders, and to uh, the need to implement gender neutral language in all areas of society. Uh, again, these interviews were back in 2017, where there wasn't uh, a lot of representation. Um, not that it's great now, but there is a bit more. Um, the second finding I want to discuss is this idea of language related distress, which was mediated by proximities. So, how close a person was to other individuals, lost my mouse, um, and the intention. So, you might see here intentional misgendering. So, again, the kind of invalidation of someone's uh, gender and uh, unintentional misgendering, so when it was sort of done by accident. What I found is that in, in order to navigate using uh, the so-called non-binary language, um, the effects of misgendering, namely the psychological distress that originated from these social interactions was context dependent and mediated by the social proximities and perceived intention. So, um, as you may see here, for instance, um, intentional misgendering coming from a, a close friend or partner. So this area is larger and sort of darker because that entailed a more significant and more intensely emotional um, distress that was caused by that uh, intentional misgendering. And that kind of dissipated depending on the emotional uh, connection to those individuals all the way to strangers. Now, unintentional misgendering, so for instance, from a close friend or partner, wasn't as distressing because it came with this expectation that maybe they messed up or they didn't do it on purpose, so they kind of would apologize and move on. And what is paradoxical here, and it was reflected in the findings, is that for strangers, you may see that this area is kind of darker and uh, and uh, larger, and this is to reflect the uh, concept of microaggressions. So this idea that while it happened from strangers, uh, and they you know they don't really mean that much to you, <laughs> but because it happens so much, it build up over time. So to uh, 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 provide an example here, Dana, who used the pronouns they, them, and identified as genderqueer, uh, they said that sometimes it hurts more than others when people use language to refer to you that is misgendering. But when you sort of blow it off, like I said, most of the time at work is just fine, but sometimes it just feels like a thousand people. And uh, you know, by the end of the day, you're like, how many times has someone misgendered me today? How many billions of times did someone refer to me as she and misgender? So this idea of a thousand paper cuts, I thought was a, an interesting and quite visceral metaphor for this kind of microaggressions and how they build over time and kind of open a, a wound of sorts. Um, so in summary, <laughs> after that really intense uh, example, um, this idea of gender and linguistic becomings uh, aims to demonstrate how gender is never static, always in a process of becoming. Um, and I think that becomings or becoming is a useful metaphor for the experiences of change, of transformation, and constant processes of emergence of gender, uh, one which is messy and complex, and is not also simply for understanding non-binary and transgenders. Uh, it's, it's for everyone to understand that these constructs, that gender, sexuality, and so on, 
are in a process and they're not in a stable kind of um, muted uh, form. Um, so gender and identity more generally uh, can be relational, always in the process of becoming uh, and a constant journey with no final destination as a lot at the beginning uh, showed for their identity. Um, and also I aim to demonstrate the ways in which both linguistic and material, which I didn't get to touch upon too much today, uh, contribute to this ongoing emergence. And it's been said that this kind of epistemological stance in psychology um, and ontological stance can rejuvenate psychological inquiry. So all in all, the, this research and this book hopefully can become something else, at least that's my hope, uh, in that it does provide some innovative research methodologies such as corpus based and network vis visualization um, within the field of psychology, although in other fields is, is much more common, such as linguistics. Um, hopefully this theory can also have an impact in terms of academia, activism and wider society. And my hope also is that these outputs can provide a vital representation of non-binary people experiences, language and embodiment uh, within the field of psychology. Um, and lastly, praxis, you know, how it's applied in the wider world. I, I'm hoping that it will have a, an impact in terms of understanding uh, language-based discrimination of non-binary people and trans people more generally, and that perhaps other researchers can um, use this research as a springboard perhaps to continue understanding uh, non-binary genders from perhaps a more intersectional perspective than I have provided in this research, which does lack uh, a more kind of uh, ethnic and racial uh, representation within it. Uh, and I know a couple of researchers who are actively doing this kind of work, and, and that's one of my regrets in this research when I started it uh, back in 2016. And that's all for me. I do want to thank the guest speakers who are going to say a couple of words, Lacus, and the organizers of this event. So thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Sebastian, and thank you everyone for listening to this very interesting, inspiring presentation. Um, we will take the questions at the end, and I would like now to invite uh, 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 Zoe, um, if you can unmute, I guess, your microphone. What I will do is, um, would you know, can I help somehow? Um, in uploading the slides, I guess. Can I share my screen? Yes, this may be easier. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, um, I don't have, I've only got one PowerPoint uh, slide anyway, so I'm not going to be. Um, OK. Sorry, I should have had it already. Uh, In the meantime, I can see there are quite a few questions in uh, the Q&A box. Oh, is it? Technology and likeness. Apologies. Let me go to the Q&A. There are some questions, and I wonder if there are any people Also welcoming, I could hear some sound that people wanted to join while you were presenting, Sebastian. So I think we're welcoming somebody else just now. Uh, Rachel, I think, Cohen. Um, I'm sorry you missed Sebastian's talk, but we're now uh, passing to Dr. Zoe Davy uh, to um, speak to us about 10, 15 minutes about uh, the book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, 
I'm sorry, I can't be there physically. Um, my train was cancelled, but you know, I am I am in solidarity with the the train strike. I'd just like to put that there. Um, um, I think this is an important book launch, and and I do encourage people uh, to read this excellent uh, book that Sebastian's produced. Um, I'm just going to talk about. Um, some of the, pick up some of the themes that Sebastian has has kind of touched on in relation to um, affect and and assemblage theory, and I hope I don't go too kind of technical. I'm trying to um, um, talk about it in real life terms, um, but I think this book provides us with um, some some tools to think through um trans and non-binary politics in the current political climate so the political climate around free speech is everywhere every day and claims have been silent no platformed and being fearful to speak is ironically everywhere in the media and social networking platforms with those people who are claiming this being given a much bigger stage to speak than they would have had if their talks, opinion pieces and rants had been left to speak. As Sarah Ahmed has suggested, whenever people um, keep being given a platform to say they have no platform, or whenever people speak endlessly about being silenced, you not only have a performative contradiction, you are witnessing a mechanism of power. They become martyrs. Chimamanda Ngozi Adiki suggested in the Reith lecture recently that social censure from other citizens stops free speech due to regimes of power, creating a climate of fear to speak about particular issues. She suggests that this stops people from having a formless roving of the mind to go nowhere and anywhere and everywhere. Adiki goes on to say that words and speech allows the pleasure of invention and is key to art and life in general, which reminded me of Deleuze and Guattari's philosophy of freedom, which I think is writ large in the voices we hear in non-binary gender identities, the language of becoming. And while I'm theoretically in favour of speech, uh, free speech, I think that we need to ask, but whose speech is heard and how does that affect? Take, for instance, the following article from the left wing press, The Mirror, and why I emphasise left wing um, is because I think um, we're often fixated on, on right wing populist um, um, politics when in fact it, um, this no platforming uh, discourse is, is everywhere. So a restaurant has cancelled and I've highlighted um, the words cancelled throughout. They, it, kept, it keeps on getting repeated um, when in fact um, what was actually said was they were refused service. Um, and I'll just give you a, a few minutes to kind of have a read of, of that. So Sarah Ahmed in her article An Infinity of Hammers has demonstrated a number of strategies being used in the media to create a figure of the unreasonable activist. 
making unreasonable demands, in this case, the LGBTQ activism that refuses to serve. This is why Miss Cobb's Family Foundation is depicted as a reasonable criticism of those who have gone too far with their claims for human rights. If we argue for inclusive goods and services, then it seems we must accept that this includes those that one disagrees with if they do not incite violence. We may need to try work differently in our attempts to create some semblance of parity if indeed this goal is our if this is the goal of our politics. We may need to look at the different strategies being used against sex gender minorities and see what can what we can do to enhance our emergence. Effective intensities on bodies demonstrates to us the power of words, which is without doubt. But what we do in the world word event depends on our desire to follow our lines of flight within ethical relations or whether we become stuck within a moral dilemma. Lives, if we let them, have nomadic characters. Deleuze and Guattari's nomadism is framed as a resistance to the micro fascisms in everyday lives, drawing on the understanding that Nietzsche has of the human as incomplete, adapting in the face of desire, has fueled a comprehension of potentiality. In that, life is in a constant state of struggle. Relations between different people who affect through varying intensities is the only way of attempting to reach a conduit to the truth of desire. Truth, however, is not a will to power that merely wants power over life, a self-determination at the expense of other possibilities or other people, but being true to our desires that move us towards new possibilities for the physicists and the psyche and their movement. Bang suggests that young people's personal project oriented politics are evolving through the building of networks that are responding to key issues and events that they feel are important. As such, the complex emergent desires of their politics are taking place within a web of cultural norms and events that can be understood as sites of political freedom, as seen in Hikimudi's reading of Deleuze's children. Hikimudi understands young people's potential for articulating flows of desire and sexuality, processes of becoming child, and broader blocks of becoming through affect, vis-a-vis -vis semiotic systems which are sites for potential political freedoms that are independent of deep structures and political positions. That is, we live on affective levels that, on the one hand, can be vectors of change, but on the other, Deleuze pessimistically warns, we can also be marred by states of impotence and slavery and states of foolishness at which time we must depend on external causes and that in these moments we are never more cut off from our power to act. I understand that this power to act is cut off in the current media politics representation assemblage, which has manifest because of the performative contradiction that we actually help to produce and because we spend too much time trying to stop people who we think are transphobic, homophobic and so on from speaking. We often think that this speech is contagious and it will spread or incite violence. And maybe it will, but this threat has been around for millennia. It ebbs and flows as we do. However, without what Foucault calls a reverse discourse, or what Deleuze calls events for producing new semiotic systems, we cannot create the effects that are needed to emerge. Anti-moralists such as Nietzsche, Spinoza and Deleuze, with whom I agree, would suggest that while things can be objectively good or bad, they are not contingent upon a moralising consciousness. 
human and non-human bodies act upon one another and produce good or bad affectations that either increases or decreases the power to act. Or as Deleuze and Guattari would suggest, it's good when the effects open a line of flight that was previously blocked. So acts may produce good effects for some and bad effects for others, which means that they are not inherently good or bad, but can lead us to observe if actions affect the non or the human positively or negatively. If someone acts and increases the capacity to act out our desires, then this is objectively good and supports a deterritorializing line of flight. But if that act decreases our power to act our, our, our desires, then this is bad and blocks us. An act of prohibition may produce um, good effects for some and good and bad effects for others. This then leads us to the question of relational ethics within that relationship. Prohibition at a different time and in a different space could in fact produce the opposite effect or a different effect altogether, which hi highlights the lack of any transcendental morality in the prohibitive act. As Deleuze and Guattari say, we can know nothing about bodies until we know what they can do. In other words, and I quote, what a body affects, what a body's affects are, how they can or cannot enter into composition with other effects, with the effects of another body, either to destroy that body or be destroyed by it, either to exchange actions and passions with it or to join with it in composing a more powerful body. These processes for anyone should not be thought of as emerging teleologically, but as Hickey Moody suggests, as a corporeal model of experimental life and subjectivity, which are always in relations of production. Deleuze and Guattari in Anti-Oedipus directs us to the question of productive relational ethics within the oscillating relationship between adults, children and the world in which they all emerge. Often oppositional relations are compelled to witness series of forces that demand them to say, I am, instead of understanding themselves as passing through a series of states of politically sanctioned cisnormativity and heteronormativity. Now, Butler's work on gender and normative values defines heteronormativity as privileging a heterosexual experience in a deeply gendered society. However, she also suggests there are possibilities to, to disrupt the repeated acts that come to congeal over time to produce a natural sort of being or as a taken for, gen, uh, taken for granted reality. These series of intersecting forces are normative in a moral sense, defining what is within the bounds of good and bad bodies by overcoding people's speaking positions as identity positions. Butler demonstrates that the sex gender system's normative univocal posturing is neither possible in the biological sciences nor within the medico-legal alliance or in other areas of life and thus has multiple contestable sites of meaning which can be exploited to subvert what she calls the foundational illusions of identity. For instance we can subvert the acceptance that two and only two gen sex genders which uphold the heterosexual homosexual binary that is widely understood as natural this is because it's not a universal desire or natural. Otherwise, white colonial settlers, for example, would not have had to force a binary sex gender medico legal framework on indigenous people whose societies were producing more complex systems of gender recognition. As Rich suggests, we must use the politics of location, that is social, ethnic, class, economic and sexual reality to question the interpretation of the sameness of a sex gender category 
within much more complex networks of power. Paul claims that some LGB people suggest that achieving successful adulthood through homonormative trajectories, such as toughing this period out or going the extra mile, is done to fit in with hetero and cisnormative culture. Santos shows in Southern Europe how LGBT activism focuses on the creation of the acceptable normal gay in relation to same-sex marriage laws and reproductive rights, which also creates new normativities and compliance. This then operates as a normalising judgment about homosexual legitimacy affecting the lives of LGB youth who have not yet reached what they are supposed to in their lives. Hall calls this compensatory subordination that is used to ward off appearing unacceptable to cisgender people and which they fear will result in a loss of protection of rights for LGB people. Contemporary research has also suggested that some applications of transnormative adultism by some trans people reify and normalise heterosexist and six cis sexist tropes about what constitutes the authentic trans person. And in order to open up the Western approach to sex gender, we must interrogate the validity and, af and affectations of the cisgender transgender binary that asserts what is trans enough. Related to this, Garrison argues that their non-binary interviewees worried that they were somehow not trans enough to claim the transgender label and thus felt apart from the trans community. And um, indeed, Valentine's ethnography of transgender community and Namaste's community based research discovered that there was no cohesive community to talk about, but there were events that brought people together into a sense of community that they have affinities with but also that boundaries at these events were sometimes erected that can produce exclusionary effects. This production of exclusionary effects, according to Finley, constitutes the respectability politics that promotes the view that sexual and gender minorities who act in a respectable way will motivate cisgender heterosexuals in positions of power to support the extension of the same rights and protection that they have to them. In response to this boundary work, others have suggested that subordination to what has taken root in the meaning systems of people, groups, or broader populations forecloses the product productive fluidity of sexuality and gender expression. Sumaru, Mathers and Moon use symbolic interactionism in an attempt to incorporate a fluid standpoint to analyses in order to adjust the recognised forms that hetero, cis, homo and transnormativities repeat when hierarchising people's practices dichotomously. However, in the attempt to highlight others' foreclosure of their participants' fluidity, they inadvertently do the same by representing them through identity categories such as non-binary gender queer person, non-binary pansexual and so on. In fact, in order to set up these tensions, the identities need to be represented, creating more I am's that may disrupt or decompose the body's relation, which tends to diminish a body's power of acting in its own right. As such, those claiming these profession, uh, claiming these pressures to conform to transnormativity by non-fluid people assume that their adversaries and themselves fixed and immovable rather than series of intersecting forces that are, not, uh, that are normative, attempting to define in a moral sense what is within the bounds of good and bad bodies through the overcoding of human speaking positions as identity positions. From this, we might learn from Crawford 
who suggest that the political impetus should be on those composing forces that undermine our best attempts at deciding conclusively on identities and selves, to overcome the reluctance to deal with identitar identitarian politics and recognise the web of cultural norms and events that can be understood as sites of political freedom. This focus does not deny the impact of those forces that generate normativities and the negative territorialising experiences, but by focusing on affective relations rather than identities, which is highlighted well in Sebastian's participants' data, may shift the emphasis to the states through which each body passes in order to challenge normative negativities. Ahmed uses the image of the hammer to demonstrate how some words are chipping away at our personhood. However, we must learn from the, the resistance we encounter from those words and by knowing that sometimes we will win and sometimes we will fail. By continuing to chip away, we will build relation, relational affinities that enables our emergence. OK, thank you. So David, thank you also very much for a contribution to today's event. And I would like to invite our last uh, speaker before we address any questions. Uh, perhaps. Slides up here. We have some slides up yeah, there. Yeah. They're in there. And it's this one. Yeah. It's like this. We'll get there. Yeah. Okay, this is correct. Ah. Hey, wonderful. Um, it's going to do something funny here because I'm terrible at doing any kind of transition thing. Is it going to do this? Is it going to do this? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so can everyone hear me? Yeah. OK, so as the corpus person, um, in a way it's quite nice link because corpus does mean body. So we look at bodies of text and what I'm interested in is how we can combine this approach with other approaches. And so when Sebastian asked me to talk, this was just amazing. This is something that I, I'm interested in, that I and I think I say something about, I hope. So I use gender neutral pronouns. If you would like to contact me on Twitter, uh, Macedon, or email, then do feel free. If you want to tweet pictures or anything, then you can, but make sure I look good. Thank you. Um, just a little content warning before I start. I am going to look at some potentially transphobic language and I will let you know when that slide is coming up and I will be looking at a term which is quite contentious but I will also be trying to kind of contextualize it in a slightly different way. So where I start off with is this idea of the linguistic term. So those of you who are in philosophy, in history, politics and sociology, are probably aware of this like lurking in the background of your discipline that there was this fundamental shift in this relationship between language and the disciplines of humanities and social sciences. So instead of looking at language as something that's kind of incidental and like it's important, this is what you need to look at, it instead started conceiving of language as this is something that's fundamental about how we can articulate things about ourselves and how we understand the world. That if we're communicating in language, then we've got to look at that language to see what can be communicated. So these social practices are constituted through language. 
So things like what does a wedding look like? What does a graduation ceremony look like? What does a date look like? What does a doctor's appointment look like? And so on are all constituted through language. We can't conceive of these things without somehow looking at language and interaction. Um, we also need to think of this discursive term. And there's a rather nice quote from this book. Don't know if you've heard about it. Uh, it's this guy called Sebastian Conover. Highly recommend the book, by the way. And what we have to think about here is this idea that these these identities and these roles and so on are socially constructed, but and we need to think about how these identities are maintained, how they're performed, how they're indexed, and how they're interpreted by others. So we're doing stuff to show our identity, so who we are as a person, as a family member, as a teacher, as a doctor, as a friend, as a partner, and so on. But we need other people to be looking at us and to recognize that that's what we're doing. So, you know, how can we be uh, a teacher without someone to teach? It's not an identity that makes sense. So we've got this idea on one hand of social constructionism, that these identities are socially and discursively constructed, that society kind of in a way creates roles for us to step into, that these roles exist before we came along and that we inhabit a role that has, that is kind of, there's a space for it, uh, to use a kind of Butlerian metaphor. So what does society enable us to do? What are the identities and so on that society recognises for us? But we've got a problem here because if we go too deep into social constructionism, then what we kind of have is the socially constructed role is all there is. That in a way it doesn't matter. Uh, so in a way, what matters is what's going on socially. What what is what is society recognizing you as? And there's a problem that it doesn't always account for individual sense of identity and their thoughts and their experiences and their histories. And particularly, and Sebastian talks about this a lot in his book, about bodily experience. That in particular, when you're looking at trans identities, what does it mean to be living in or with, or some, you know, kind of there with a trans body? So we've got, this trans terminology as articulating a very particular set of experiences, but these are socially and historically contextual. So what we understand as trans right now, or what we understand as non-binary right now in the year 2022 in London, in the UK, in a fairly, uh, fairly academic audience, is not going to be what is understood around the world as non-binary, not going to be understood in different, uh, different situations, and is incredibly unstable historically. So if anyone's interested in this, Kit Hayam's uh, Before We Were Trans is a really nice account of, yes, there are people who have gender diverse experiences, and who speak about their gender in a non-binary way, but not using the terms that we would use right now. So how can we find these histories and experiences and how can we identify them in before we had the terminology as trans? So from a trans perspective, we need to be thinking about the words we have to describe ourselves. So when I call myself non-binary, what other options do I have? And indeed, what did I experience before I had that word? We need to think about this idea about dysphoria and how we experience being in our bodies. And I realize I'm setting up a weird little Cartesian thing here because you know, what are you without a body? We haven't quite got to brains and jars yet. But why do we consider dysphoria such an essential part of being trapped? 
can you be trans or non-binary and not feel dysphoria? We need to think about how we are able to move through the world as a gendered being. So what are the ways in which the world kind of forcibly genders us? And in the UK system, as a non-binary person, I lack legal recognition. So my passport has a letter on it that doesn't bear any relationship to how I experience myself. The wedding ceremony that I took part in had to gender me and had to say that I was a wife or a husband. So what does it mean to experience that? And we need to think about the roles and the characteristics that we can accept and reject. So going back to this idea about bodily experience, some of our bodily experiences are incredibly profound and cannot be accounted for with social constructionism. So I'm pretty sure that every trans and non-binary person who is in this room or is in the UK has probably had the experience of, why do you have to transition? Why can't you just be a really kind of gentle and kind and, and feminine man? Or why can't, you know, like, you know that women can be scientists as well, no? Or why do you, basically, why do you have to make this awkward for yourself? Why can't you just kind of expand the category of woman or man? Why do you have to transition? And this is something that I experienced. Uh, I did, and also these identities shift over time as well. I will get onto that in a bit as well. So, the idea that I'm kind of circling around a bit is this idea of assemblage. And I've chosen to illustrate this through an artistic assemblage. So this is some work by uh, Barbara Frank, who is an artist who basically works with dis discarded stuff. So she creates these beautiful animal and bird sculptures out of stuff that is just kind of being rejected by workshops that would have been thrown into rubbish, but she can pick something up and see, okay, I can see a jawline in that, or I can see a bit of spine, or I can see an eye or a tail. And assemblage theory is a bit like that, in that you're kind of picking up stuff that doesn't necessarily go, might not have been developed for that purpose, but you can see how it might fit into other things. So I particularly like like the cats, and as Sebastian has a cat, I just thought, cats. So it includes all of these different things. So it includes historical perspectives and objects. So what are the objects that we choose to surround ourselves with, or the objects that we choose to wear or decorate ourselves with? It involves processes, it involves embodiment, it involves these social and material perspectives and it also includes linguistic perspectives. So I put some images there because I think that they all say something about gender and how gender is articulated and expressed in different contexts. That might that you need a certain level of immersion in a culture to understand that the hand reaching out with the blue, white and pink stripes is the trans flag colours but you won't necessarily understand that unless you know what the trans flag looks like. That this uh, woman here wearing a red sari is an Indian bride, but again, you need to be immersed in that culture to recognize the significance of the color and the clothing. Uh, for my sins, I'm a linguist, so that's what I'm particularly interested in. So how can we use linguistic approaches to kind of feed into this assemblage? So I'm not saying that linguistics is the only thing we should be interested in, but perhaps it's like a whisker or it's a paw or something among all of these other theoretical approaches. So language use is particularly useful because it offers an insight into how individuals and communities and societies articulate gender. So when we talk about gender, we can examine that talk. And it's essential to move between the two. So we've got to locate the individual within the community 
that none of us are just individuals on our own, just kind of fumbling around with no one else in sight. But equally, we've got to identify these larger trends that shape the community. So can you, so it's quite difficult to be non-binary or trans without having any contact with other non-binary and trans people. So what we kind of get is this cycle of going between the individual use into the community use, and then from the community of use back into the individual use. And you can use different linguistic approaches to try and kind of identify bits there. So discourse analysis lends itself really nicely to looking at individual use. And corpus linguistics, which is what I and a couple of others in this room do, is really good at looking at these more uh, community or social trends. Uh, discourse analysis, I like to think of it as kind of a toolbox. So discourse analysis is not just one single approach. You can't just say, oh yes, I do discourse analysis, because yes, you do, but someone's going to be like okay but but what type do you have a screwdriver or, or do you like hands basically and it encompasses a lot of different approaches ranging from thematic analysis narrative analysis arguably grounded theory social actor analysis name discourses and so on what's really in a way really beautiful about it is that you examine a relatively small amount of text in a great amount of detail so most people probably wouldn't want to look at hundreds of texts using, say, thematic analysis. There are different meanings of discourse as well, which can be quite useful in kind of shaping exactly what you're doing and what you're, you're trying to achieve. That we have discourse, which is text at the level of the sentence or the utterance or above. So uh, words, or, or sounds as they are um, kind of created across paragraphs or entire texts or books and so on. And we've also got this more critical theory idea of discourse as articulating a way of understanding or a set of beliefs or a worldview. So that's discourse analysis. I like it. It's very complementary to my other favourite approach which is corpus linguistics. So corpus linguistics basically takes a principled large collection of naturally occurring machine readable texts. So it has to be principled. So that means you can't just throw any old stuff in it. So you need to have a sense of principles that are going to guide you in what goes into your corpus. It can't be just, oh yeah, I'll put in that email from my mom few texts from my best friend, that uh, science fiction novel I started writing and never finished, um, my PhD thesis, yeah, great one. You, you can't just kind of throw in a bunch of texts and hope for the best. So it has to be constructed along a set of guiding principles. So forum posts that are restricted to a particular forum over a particular period of time, yes. Uh, they have to be naturally occurring. So we're getting texts that, that actual people are writing. We're not getting kind of artificially generated text. And they have to be machine readable because what we do is we use specialist programs to look for patterns within these. So corpora can be, they can range from thousands to billions of words. The nice thing about it is that corp is that Basically, you're using the best things from a from a human's and that analytical abilities with the best things from a computer's analytical abilities. This is the idea. Ideally, you want the best of both. You do not want the worst of both. So, for example, humans are. In <laughs> no, no, you didn't. You didn't. Yours is great. <laughs> so. Humans are incredibly bad at looking up, say, repeated strings of characters. Here is a book. If I asked you to go through and highlight and then count every occurrence of the word the, 
first of all, you would probably cry. Or no, first of all, you'd probably hate me. And then you'd probably cry. And then shortly afterwards, you would lose count. So humans super bad at finding, say, all of the occurrences of the word the and the words that comes after it. Computers are great at that. I could load a machine readable copy of this into one of my programs, ask it to find the, and a couple of seconds later, it will give me all of the occurrences of the word the. So that's really nice. And then the human can do the, the in a way, the analytical stuff of identifying these patterns and what these patterns are doing. So patterns might be lexical, so what words go together. They might be grammatical, so what kind of grammatical category does this word kind of fall under? And they might be semantic, so what kind of meaning is being created by this word? And ideally, you do a kind of zooming in and a zooming out. So I've chosen to illustrate this with some moss because moss is a rhizome. Let's let's go for a bit of Deleuze there. So when we look at a lot of moss, it looks very different from what if we look at it under a, a close up macro lens. And neither of the if you said, you know, what is moss and someone just showed you that picture, it would be an incomplete picture. But equally, if someone said, what is moss, and you show them that picture, it would also be incomplete. So what you're trying to do is shift between these two perspectives in order to give a fuller sense of what is this thing that I'm interested in. So this is where we come to a term that is has a contentious history. So it's this word tranny, but it's this real, it's, when you start untangling the history, it gets really complicated because there is this evidence of use as, self, as a term of self-designation by gender diverse people. So this is an image of Vicky Lee's uh, Tranny Guide. This is the ninth edition. Um, you can see, yeah, it was updated for 2001, 2002. And it was basically a kind of magazine and collection of resources and events and kind of big and answers for people who were seeking information about this. Uh, there's a leaflet by Queer Power Now that was produced in London in 1991 or so. And what's was useful about this term is that it can stand for various other terms. So it can stand for transvestite, for transsexual, for transgender, and so on. So you get it being used as this umbrella term to try and highlight some of these commonalities of experience. However, there's this increasingly, uh, it kind of increasing evaluation of the term as negative and the term is sanctioned by the mid 2000s. So for example, in the GLAD media reference guide from 2006, we've got like, don't use this term, it could offend people. So what's really interesting is how do we get from this term that is being used as a term of self-designation to don't use it, people will be upset. So what I was, this is, so this is an incredibly quick and dirty corpus analysis. Uh, it's something that my, my uh, co-investigator, Alon, over there and I are working on at the moment. And what we're interested in, in is where do these different meanings come from? Where do these different, where can these different meanings be found? Can we trace these different meanings across different texts? So what does it mean in a corpus of English language news and blogs? What does it mean in a corpus of erotica, which is the collection of texts we're working from, when someone says, hey, Kat, uh, I've got 1.4 billion words of erotica. Do you want to do something with it? You don't say no. <laughs> and what happens in these individual narratives? Um, so this is the uh, little content warning for the next slide. So this is some stuff from the English language news and blog section. 
I'm not going to read out these occurrences and I'm going to tell you when I've moved on to the slide after it. So if you do want to look away or, or be happily distracted by your phone, feel free. Okay, so I have highlighted the word. So I'll give you a moment to have a skim through. So I've moved to the next slide now. So one of the things I found out is that the word has two meanings. One is to refer to trans people, and the other is to refer to motor transmission. So I was there kind of trying to fil filter out, does tranny mean a person, or does tranny mean some kind of car thing, which I, as a massive queer, do not understand. And so there were some things like, and yes, the cost of tranny repair is three thousand dollars and it was like well uh, i did decide to exclude that one so what we tend to find is that it's a term of abuse that co-occurs with other terms of abuse that it's something undesirable that someone complains about something being uh, such some of the stuff is this so-called culture war concerns where tranny is lumped in with a, a bunch of other stuff about cultural Marxism and, and other things. There are There is evidence of these debates about the appropriateness of use and its potential to offend, but we also get these little traces of perhaps historical usage by trans people. So, for example, a transgender film festival that was called Tranny Fest. And there's a piece of writing that appears to be by a trans person who refers to herself as in something going on in this tranny's head. However, the most uh, prevalent usage is that of a term of abuse. So. What happens when we turn to another corpus? And this one is uh, from Erotica. It's this 1.4 billion word corpus of online erotica. It's more than, than you or I could read, even with a lot of you know, very committed work. So we use this com these computer programs to look for patterns in it. Uh, we don't know the author's identity, and we're also really aware that the identity that someone might create for use on this site might not reflect their, their kind of air quotes legal identity. And that the experiences and interactions they write about may not reflect things that they've actually experienced, and they might not reflect even things that they wish to experience, that sometimes people like to keep things, like to keep fantasies as purely fantasy. Uh, Alon did some very nice stuff with Geffy to get some of these networks. And what we find is that uh, Tranny appears kind of in the middle, quite cl close to uh, transgender, transsexual and transvestite, but also near things like queer and fag and sissy, which seem to be these kind of, these kind of uh, queered identities that somehow you're not performing the gender that society has assigned you as in the correct way. So this is uh, what the computer program looks like. Don't feel, feel free not to read it. This is a lot of people being extremely horny on main. <laughs> it's very horny, guys. Uh, so what you can do is you can sort it, so you can sort it so you can see these patterns more clearly. And then you can start to try and account for these patterns. So what we found is that admits people being extremely horny in a variety of very interesting ways, like genuinely it's fascinating. Uh, Trannies are women and not men. So actually they tend to be pretty, pretty certain that these are women. These are women who might have non-normative bodies, but very definitely women. There's a lot of concern about being read as female. 
there's stuff to do with community and classification. So are you a transgender person or a transvestite or a crossdresser? There's stuff to do with transcending gender of somehow having this abundance of gender rather than a lack of gender. So basically you have all of the gender and all of the different genders going on at once. There's stuff to do with transformation. So the kind of rituals that people do to make themselves uh, legible as a particular gender. There's stuff to do with fantasies of being. There's stuff to do with desirability. There's a lot to do with desirability and just like how hot it is. There's stuff to do with sexual dynamics of topping and bottoming and so on. And when we do see stuff that does seem a bit more kind of negative, it tends to be in the context of forced feminization, where femininity is imposed rather than embraced. But even then, it's stuff that the person kind of wants secretly, but can't admit to. So there's this real tension about this public reveal of something that's quite private. What we find in individual narratives is that I chose to have a look at uh, some of these narratives of transformation. And you get sometimes these really tender and beautiful description of someone being allowed to dress in the clothes that they want, or that they're making decisions about how best to feel good and how to affirm themselves through clothing. That um, people are being treated to this abundance of, of stuff and it's helping with embodiment. So you get this honestly quite affirming stuff in the midst of all of this incredibly horny stuff. Um, this is a story that I quite like that you might not be able to read it. I've tried to make the text as big as I can, but it's, um, I believe it's a truck driver who, pick, who picks up a trans hitchhiker and they just are having this nice chat in the cab of the truck and the the woman, um, so Tina says that she's a pre-op tranny and so on, uh, but then actually says these things about some of the things that she's that she that the character has experienced. So uh, picking's a slim when you live a double world. I am afraid you either get some creep who just wants to experience a tranny but would never take you out on a real date or some married guy who hasn't realized he is actually gay yet. So you get a character kind of complaining about some of the, the, the kind of relationships dynamics she's experienced. But then you get this really, really positive analysis from this uh, supposedly heterosexual uh, cab dri uh, truck driver, that she's the most intriguing person I had talked to in a long, long time. Uh, she was refreshing. We didn't always agree on things, but our arguments were debated with tact and politeness. Uh, that he likes her, that it's this real, in a way, it's this really affirming narrative. So what we're finding here is that even in a, te in a, a corpus that might appear to be on the surface, oh God, it's going to be like, it's, you know, it's going to be kind of really tokenizing, it's going to be really problematic. We find these kind of little areas carved out that do seem to be intensely affirming and which are affirming of trans people as desirable, as sexual beings. So where I'm kind of ending up here is that we've got assemblages, but working in different ways. That on one hand, we've got this assemblage of methodology that corpus linguistics and carefully chosen corpora can help identify these non-mainstream discourses. That if you've got a big body of text, the chances are that you're going to find evidence of these minority discourses that might not be apparent if you're only able to look at say 40 or 60. And we can identify where there are kind of these accumulations of language and thought as expressed through these repeated patterns. But then I'd also argue that there's an assemblage of trans terminology, that there isn't this unified approach to the terms that trans people use, 
that depending on location and history and experience and so on, you might use very different terms. And that's something to be really, really aware of. That there's an inherent messiness of researching terms with complex pasts and presents and very probably futures that we ourselves do not know what the trajectory of a term like non-binary or genderqueer is going to be. Perhaps in 50 years time, someone's there going to be like, oh gosh, this is so problematic. How could they be using this term about themselves? And we need methodologies or, or kind of uh, methodological assemblages that can account for this messiness and for this, this kind of instability and this unpredictability about where a term might have been and where it's going. So that's it for me. Thanks. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for being back and inviting me. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Kat. That was uh, very, very interesting as well. Um, as you can tell, I'm not an excellent uh, moderator because I let everyone speak for hours and, and, and we're already at the time where we are meant to be finishing. So a, a bit of time for a few questions. I will start with the room. I was meant to start the discussion, but I think if somebody has a question in the room, let's go to you. Uh, the back. Well, Okay, yeah. Um, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you, Sebastian, for writing this very interesting book, which I enjoy reading. <laughs> I quite like that you went beyond positivism and social constructionism and came up with the assemblage theory because um, gender and gender identities and identities in general are very, very in between both perspectives. Now, at uh, on my Kindle thing, page 272. <laughs> Spoiler alert, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, on the Kindle is 272, so I'm going to I'm going to read it anyway. No, 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 it's not. It's not. It's, it's, I mean, it's very, very, fa this book is very, very fascinating. But when I was reading it and I came to that page, I was like, yeah, there you go. Um, the interview and short writing participants were mostly assigned female at birth individuals who were, for the most part, white and held advanced degrees. However, this was not measured directly and was found during the data collection. This could be interpreted as a limitation to the study as experiences of assigned male in, at birth individuals, people of color and people with low educational attainment were largely under, unrepresented. So the question I want to ask is, are you looking into addressing that either personally or collaboratively? So I'm thinking of people with positionalities that align with those you, you felt were underrepresented by your research. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that is a really good question, and it's something that I sort of mentioned in today's presentation and in the limitations of the research. And that comes from the place where I suppose I was at at the beginning of the research. and in the research process, if you want to call it as an assemblage. <laughs> Later on, I, I realized that I could have done more to uh, account for more diverse set of voices and, and experiences. Um, and it is something that I would like to continue doing research on and, and to be more intersectional and, and um, 
inclusive in that in that sense. And earlier, in fact, we were discussing this um, this idea of you know what would it be like to do this research again? And I think that's definitely an area that I've acknowledged as a limitation. And uh, this is uh, edition number one, so there could be an edition number two in another three to five years. <laughs> <Bishop>. <laughs> I think it's all, like yeah, that. I think it's also partly to do with how do you recruit participants? Yeah. And I I mean, I've been out as an on for well over a decade. And it's really oh and also as someone who is a person of colour, I've really noticed that there's only really been a surgeon of non-binary people of colour within the past few years that when I first came out as non-binary it was so white everything was white you went to you went to a non-binary event and it was like yeah here I am <laughs> yeah here I am the brown one and then you know you met the, the other brown non-binary person in London and that was just like god we're siblings <laughs> but I think it was I think it was a constraint of the community that it was very, very white, non you know, uh, black and black, Asian, minority ethnic, non binary. But trying to reach us was hard, but also, we were, like, as a group, there were so few of us who were quite suspicious of this. As you should. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, you know, there's like five people who are out and it's like, oh, uh, Yeah, and the, the recruitment process you mentioned method was mostly through social media um, and it was uh, snowballing. And it, it was a matter of, at the beginning for me, in fact, was can I actually get people and I was actually quite surprised because I managed to come of the group. I was delighted, surprised, but also in that sense, later disappointed that it didn't. Uh, but yes, I think. Uh, am I speaking for collaborators who are interested <laughs> and who just finished their PhD? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions? And in the meantime, if uh, Dr. David wants to intervene from home, I guess you can unmute uh, your microphone. Oh, yes. Uh, so anyone in the in the room? There were a few questions, I think. It wasn't just your notes, uh, Sebastian, I think. OK, so uh, Sebastian, you have a positive comment here. I love how you discussed gender as never static, a becoming, a metaphor for the emergence, messy and complex. What individual differences differentiate those who appreciate and gravitate towards this kind of richness and nuance from those threatened by it? Kruglaski's need for closure, essentialist beliefs. That's a that's a quite quite the question, Avi, and I think we should discuss it over drinks soon. <laughs> That's my remark. <laughs> yes, definitely. Thank you, Avi. And Diana, I think that we had a few uh, technical problems I see here. Um, yes, there were uh, apologies. Some people you couldn't hear um, some of the presentations. Apologies about this. Any other questions on the floor? One thing I wanted to ask, inspired by the last presentation, um, it was, what is there an ideal, what we would expect 
the language to move towards in 20 years. I, I struggle, I misgendered somebody last week only, and I'm supposed to be working in this field from a more positivistic perspective, but still. And then I was thinking my native language is so gendered. If I struggle, I wonder how other people who are not even involved in this kind of discussions. And what is the ideal? Is it something from a linguistic perspective? Is it It's really hard to anticipate these trajectories because I think in the past I've I've studied historical social movements and what you always find is that the person who is organizing that protest or that march or that letter writing campaign or that petition is convinced that this is going to be the one that's the, the deciding factor. And it often isn't. So at the time, people are using language that they they see as okay. Well, it's not perfect, but it fulfills the needs that I require of it. So it is hard to anticipate where that language might go, and it is one of these kind of lines of flight that that are trying to, in a way, escape some of our conceptions of language. Um, where I think we're probably going to go is that languages that have very gendered sets of pronouns and especially especially suffixes are probably going to probably going to do something there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You can probably speak to what's happening in Spanish. Yes, I mean, I think the comment that I have is that language is imperfect and that we use language as we have it to describe what we can. But that's the magic of language is that it changes, it evolves with the cultural identitarian or social demands. So it it's not something that can be said, there's going to be an ideal language uh, because we don't know where that's going to go. We um, don't know what the ideal is. And is there an ideal? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was interested that you said evolve there because that just suggests this kind of getting better. But alternatively, what if some of the language that we've perhaps discarded has been useful in itself? Mm -hmm. Perhaps one, some, perhaps some of the language that we have now isn't better than some previous time. I don't know. And I guess the in Spanish. Um, there have been a number of movements to make language more inclusive. Um, so rather than saying uh, uh, cansado, which is tired, cansada, which is the masculine and the feminine, people will say cansade. So adding the E as a kind of neutral form. And within non-binary communities in Spanish speaking countries, that is a fact and people understand it and use it, but outside of those communities, it, it might not be the same. Um, and there might be challenges and pushbacks, including by the Ac Academy of Spanish um, language who are completely against it. And does the same case in France as well. Uh, but within the communities, it is used, it's understood, and it's language because language users are using it and it, it has meaning. So whether it's ideal, we'll see, but. Whether it's fit, but I think we can say it's better than or gendered language. So it's definitely doing something to make the experience of non-binary language users better. Mm. But is it kind of where we'll end up? Is it the final form? I don't know. Is that no? There, there is a hand. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. The erotic of one point mm -hmm. five billion. Is there any way to let's say um, access? I don't know Facebook comments and then run the program through Facebook comments. Uh, 
Okay, so this might be a little more technical than what you're looking for. So with a lot of social media, they really don't like you trying to scrape Facebook comments. So there are tools that you can use that will kind of collect the material, but social media sites will often do things to actively hinder you. So there was kind of a little golden period of getting Facebook comments, but it's increasingly fallen out of disfavor because the sites developers are putting in these barriers. Uh, but people have used, say, Twitter comments. I have used newspaper comments. Um, there's actually some really interesting discussions about Mastodon about explicitly don't scrape this. Hey, researchers, kind of can we be a bit more aware of privacy issues here? So it's very much of quite a dynamic area. In short, yes, it's doable. Yes, people have done it. But generally, you have to have a slightly more manual way of copying and pasting things rather than being able to kind of uh, basically set your, your scraper tool on a, on a Facebook page and just letting it hoover up the data. You could also ask for permission in a yeah. particular Facebook group and ask the moderator to allow you to basically get the data. Yeah. But even that, you know, they would need to ask permission from everyone else, make a post, be more democratic about it. So yeah, opt in stuff. So yeah, there are two issues. One is the privacy issue of increasingly bad form to just hoover up people's data, especially in closed groups or in private groups or groups where people are making an effort to not make it public. But also then you have the more um, kind of technical issues as well. Thank you, everyone. There may be some more questions, in which case we have 10 minutes uh, to ask them in person while you're consuming five bottles of wine that are waiting there. A few macarons and uh, some orange juice. Uh, you can also email uh, Sebastian directly, uh, especially those of you who are at home and you didn't get the opportunity to interact too much with us. Uh, I would also I would like to thank again all the speakers. Invite uh, as many of you to join the Global Diversities and Equalities Research Center at London Metropolitan University. You can send an email to their directories, uh, Louise Ryan, so L dot Ryan at LondonMet.ac.uk. Uh, or you can email Sebastian and I'm 